Thank you very much, Brenda, for keeping that so short. That was great. But you said three words, and I was thinking big, dumb ass. So my wife would have used those instead. Thank you so much for being here today. And I hope that most of you are here because of Gordon Bernard getting his Lifetime Achievement Award right after this. He is one of my two mentors. The other one is Bob Dittus, and he is here with his wife, Becky. And so it's a real privilege for me to have the two people who have been the most influential in my academic medical career here today. I'm not going to show you any slides. Uh, that drove everybody crazy down in the speaker ready room, by the way. They wanted slides. I said, I don't have any. I'm going to do it by just telling stories. And so it's really my great privilege to be giving this Aki Grinvik lecture today. Aki is obviously one of the most important people ever in the field of critical care. Coming from Sweden as a cardiothoracic surgeon and an anesthesiologist and a pilot, that's pretty amazing right there, those three things. But then he comes to the United States, gets hired by Peter Saffer as the first, we think, the first critical care fellow ever in the United States. It's a pretty big honor. He goes on then to train over 500 fellows in critical care. So essentially one of the fathers of critical care and is now happily retired, I think, living in Texas, and his life influence on our field goes on forever. Everything from his helping President Reagan and their committees to define brain death, to how do we teach. And he apparently had this habit of getting to the hospital about three in the morning. And uh, Derek Angus told me a story that on his first day that he arrived from Scotland, he, the plane was late and he was tired and he called Aki to let him know that he had arrived and it was a, it was a Saturday night. And Aki said, oh great, I'm so glad you're here and I'm sure you don't get jet lag, I'll see you in the morning for morning report. And Derek was like, whoa, that's a Sunday morning. But he showed up 7 a.m. and uh, now he's the chairman of critical care there at UPMC and one of my very dear friends. So it's a great privilege for me as a surrogate. Uh, I don't feel like uh, I've done anything to warrant being the person giving this lecture, but nevertheless, I will try and take you through an entertaining story about how it came to be that ICU liberation, the movement, and this ABCDF bundle got developed. And the title of the lecture was The Science Of. So I want you to know the science behind this, and I'm going to describe it for you in, these, in the next uh, 30 or so minutes. Before we get there, though, I wanted to start by just telling you some of the people that have been involved in this situation. If you go all the way back to the first PAD guidelines, who were, which were led by Judy Jacoby, and in the next PAD guidelines, which were published in 2013 and led by Julie Barr, the next subsequent version coming out next year at SCCM being led by Ioana Skrobik and John Devlin and all of the large committees of people who are so immersed in the evolution of the game here trying to take the literature, mold it so that we as clinicians can do a better job of caring for our patients. In addition to that though, you have to have people in the current situation like those involved in Thrive. So if you've got the ICU circumstance, the immediate period thereafter, and then the months and years following critical illness, we now know that in order for patients to thrive, we should pay better attention to the ways that they are suffering after we get them off of the ventilator and off of the pressors and back into life. There's a, a great title of, I think it's reference number 10. I was just looking over this paper that I wrote for this plenary, and um, it was something like, uh, life after the ICU. It's life, but not as we know it. And that's a, a beautiful way of putting the scary circumstance that our patients find themselves in. Uh, I wanted to also comment on the fact that we wouldn't be here today if it weren't for some dollars having been gifted to us. The, all the people at the SCCM who have been so instrumental in, in, in helping to run the ICU liberation program, like Vishaka Kumar, Diane Byram, Lori Harmon, worked so hard with the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation to get the funding. Just as we had worked to get funding for the, S for the sepsis guidelines, we eventually got funding for the ICU liberation program. And many of you may not realize that Gordon Moore, who founded Intel, think of computer chips, got sick and was in the ICU and suffered from ICU delirium. And after that experience, he said, whoa, 
That was horrible. And also, you wouldn't allow my family to be with me. So that was terrible. And I want to do something so that critical care can improve its process, historically evolve in the right direction. And so the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation helped to fund the ICU liberation movement, if you will. So those are some acknowledgments I want to say, since I am essentially here speaking on behalf of this huge cadre of people, uh, it would be inappropriate for me to, to not bring those, those uh, personalities up. Now, before we get to the science of ICU liberation, let me focus on you for a moment. You sitting there in the chairs and listening and thinking about your careers. Because as I tell this story of how this evolved and how our field has changed according to the science, I want you to be asking yourself, what got you here into this chair? What was it that drew you into the field of medicine? from whatever interprofessional circumstance that may be, nursing, pharmacy, social work, med physicians, so on and so forth, NPPA, hospital chaplaincy, and I'm sure I'm missing some, respiratory therapists, physical therapists. Uh, there are so many different people in this room who comprise that interprofessional team that are here to serve the patient. So if you ask yourself, having been drawn into medicine, what are your rituals and how do you go about your day in order to achieve beneficence and be benevolent at the bedside? I want you to open your mind to the concept that because of the science I'm about to share with you, you might have to sacrifice some of your rituals to improve them. And the reason I'm stating this right up front is that what we have learned in the ICU Liberation Program sponsored by the SCCM is that it is super hard to change our established ways. And yet the data are telling us that we're not doing this adequately. And so you're gonna to have to be willing to change some of the rituals of how you go about approaching the patient at the bedside. And the other thing I'm gonna say, and then I'll get started with this story, but I first wanted you to have in your head asking yourself the question, what drew me here? Oh yeah, I'm reminded, am I doing it well enough? Is this concept that you may be opposed to protocolization, you may be opposed to standardization because you think, wait a minute, I know how to do this, I've got gray hair, I'm very good at what I do, but we have to not trick ourselves into thinking that we are always doing things to the best service of our patients. And in just the last hour, I was, we were having a conversation about physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia, and I was pointing out the difference between uh, benevolence and beneficence. And I'm gonna give you a good a good example of that right now that has to do with Hawaii. I thought of this about 30 minutes ago. Uh, benef benevolence is when we want, we wish somebody well. And beneficence is actually to do good. So the difference between wishing good and doing good. And a couple of years ago, I brought my wife down here. We came in here on our honeymoon 28 years ago. She's a pathologist, super smart, went to MIT. She makes up for my, academic, my intellectual deficits. That's why I, I, I went out with her so she could get me through biochemistry in med school. <laughs> you, you laugh. I, fl I flunked my first test. Uh, but anyway, we came down here, we went to the, the Big Island and we went to the Waipio Valley. Anybody been there? Pretty amazing place. And it was my idea that we would go find this house that was up in a tree way back in Waipio Valley on the Big Island. And I had this Ford Explorer and I told Kim I was gonna show her this house. But the problem was we got up to this river and I didn't know how to get to the other side because the road went in one side and out the other. My benevolent idea, wishing, wishing us to do good was, let me ask, I asked somebody, they said, oh yeah, you can drive on through there. And so I did and I drove and I steadily was going you know, four or five miles an hour, deeper, deeper, water coming up to the headlights, deeper, deeper, water on the, he on the hood, deeper, water on the windshield. Kim in the back seat, losing her mind. The car is underwater, not, all, not to the roof, but on the windshield. Kept driving, came out the other side. She's flipping me off from the back seat. And uh, that was an example of me wishing well, but not actually doing well. I called the insurance company, by the way, the next day. And I said, you know, this, um, this YPO Valley. Oh yeah, yeah, let me interrupt you. Whatever you do, don't drive your car down there. They said some dumbass drove his car down there last week and it got washed away by the river, $50,000 Ford Explorer. I said, oh, don't worry, I would never do that. <laughs> no way. 
Um, so I asked you to think of what got you into medicine. And I wanted to tell you what got me into medicine. Um, well, what got me on this track towards ICU liberation anyway. I was a second year med student at Charity Hospital in New Orleans going to Tulane Medical School. I'm from Louisiana. Used to ride him alligators to school, you know, damn man. Gordon Bernard, same. And I had a patient, young woman, postpartum cardiomyopathy. And as I was caring for her, we were on the wards second year. I'll never forget the fear in her eyes as she was approaching death. And I don't mean approaching death in a matter of days. I mean approaching death in a matter of minutes. We were on a ward in charity that had no electricity. We would, we would, um, they would uh, ration, looking for the word, ration electricity. Half the hospital in charity would have electricity on one day and the other half would have it on the other day. They called it the L side and the T side, LSU and Tulane. And if your patient had anything electric, you'd have to wheel them to the side of the hospital that had electricity. True story. On this day, my T patient, Tulane patient, was on the non-electric side, but she was in shock because of her cardiomyopathy on a dopamine drip. We used dopamine back then. And we were titrating it by dialing up and down on the IV pole. And she died right there in front of my eyes, petrified. And I decided right then and there, this was somewhat barbaric. This wasn't right. And it was not only technically wrong, but I knew that intellectually we didn't have sufficient knowledge. To do, right, to do the right thing for her. So I decided to go into critical care. And for the next several years, I moved ahead with my training and went, to, went on to a pulmonary critical care fellowship. Now, I wrote this article for the plenary with you in mind, thinking that I will write the story according to the way it should be told so that I can use the article to tell the story. So on the second page of the article, a bit of history, I divide up the last 50 years of critical care into two quarter centuries. The first quarter century of critical care built up from Ashbaugh, Petty, Bigelow's paper in 67 with ARDS up to the early 90s, <clears throat> which I really view as our, the period of time where we were getting ourselves technically right, technically in order. As uh, Gordon used to tell me, imagine a kid being given keys to a car and telling them to drive the car across the town, the kid's going to wreck the car. And that's what we were doing in critical care all through the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. But a lot of very smart people did randomized control trials and other sorts of investigations, which helped us mature the critical care so that we could get the car across town without wrecking it. But in the process, even though the patient was able to survive, the patient got wrecked. And I think of the way that we, uh, were, that we strap down patients and overly sedate them and we immobilize them and dehumanize them and we take our eyes off of the patient and put them on the monitor. So by the end of that first quarter century of critical care, we were very good at taking people out of the dead column and switching them into the living column. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is, yeah, but for what life? Like I told you that reference that I cited the title of, to, to what life? And to give you an example of what was going on during that first quarter century, I'll tell you uh, this story that I included at the beginning of the paper. I was in the ICU. We had the data from William, William Shoemaker on D.02. We had the data on, uh, on IDE ratio and inversing the IDE ratio. Think Didier Dreyfus. For example, one of the huge giants in critical care. And so I'm looking at, at another patient, and she is Michelin tire person, used to, if, for, the, for the older people in the room who remember that ad, you know, bloated, extremely swollen, four plus pitting edema over at Anasarca. And we're driving more fluids into this patient in order to drive up the D.02. We carried in our pockets the formula for the D.02, that's oxygen, oxygen delivery, and we were trying to maximize getting up from 400 to 600 uh, a D.02. And I said to my attending, you know, what gives? I mean, this is crazy. We're driving, we're giving so much fluid to this person. They're over, just grossly edematous. And, and then the ventilator is set up in a way that the person could not even begin to tolerate the circumstance because I can't breathe in a one-to-one -one ratio, let alone a two-to-one ratio. 
And so imagine that for all the young people in the room. You're not right now breathing at a one to three or a one to four. Okay. Short in, long out. But what if to, in order to up your mean airway pressure, we say, well, let's make it a one to one or a two to one. So you would go like this. <gasps> and holding that that in for so much longer, so your expiration's short, you're building up intrathoracic pressure, your mean airway pressure rises, and then by definition, you get a better oxygenation, your P to F ratio looks prettier, and we think that things are good. But it turns out in that first quarter century of critical care that the P to F ratio was not a good surrogate for survival and especially for long-term outcomes. So as I said this to to my attending, he said, look, I don't give a rat's ass what she looks like. We're driving the D.02 and getting the IDE ratio right because that's what the literature says. So that's my best way to describe for you where we were at that time in critical care. The second quarter century, I think, we've spent figuring out how to do this survival business in a more humane manner, where we should put our eyes back on the patient, go back to the bedside, and that is what ICU liberation is all about. We're liberating the patient from the iatrogenic injury that we have caused or can cause so easily with these interventions. So I hope by way of history that helps you. um, I've also thought of this analogy of the front end and back end of critical care. And I use this often so that for you, this this part is the front end. It's when somebody is getting increasingly ill. But when we get them through all of our interventions and we throw them onto the patient aggressively and in a time-sensitive manner, antibiotics, fluids, uh, vasopressors, dialysis, mechanical ventilation, et cetera, we get the patient stabilized out. Then we get the patient on the back end of critical care once these things are no longer needed and we remove them. And we've often said that if you take the whole arch of critical illness... What we have done in the past 15 years, the latter part of this newer phase of critical care, is we've switched the division point of the front end and the back end of critical care dramatically. So here's the front end, and we used to say the back end was way over here at, say, day five, day six, day seven. And once we put things on on Monday, we'd leave them on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then on Friday, we'd say, hey, you know, it's about time we should get rid of some of this stuff. Let's go ahead and get them off the blower. So the danger for us atrogenically was we put it on on the first day and we left it on so long that the immobilization, the excessive amount of sedatives and narcotics, et cetera, were actually causing harm, but we didn't know it. So there we were trying to be benevolent, but we weren't beneficent. We actually didn't do as much good as we could have done. So what we've done is we've switched that front end, back end division way earlier. And what ICU liberation is all about is being good advocates for the patient so that as soon as we put interventions on that are helping them to survive, we immediately question the need for them anymore and try and remove them earlier in time as soon as they are no longer required. Now, let me shift over to what happened to develop us into the ICU liberation movement from about 1998 until 2016, 2017, and just give you a bit of brief history about how we got there. And I'm going to look at my phone every once in a while to make sure that we're okay and on time. Um, Before we had the A, B, C, D, E, F bundle, we just started studying things that we thought mattered on the back end of critical care. And back in 1998, when I came to Vanderbilt for the first time, and there are many people doing this. When I say we, I do not mean I. I mean we, meaning around the globe. Uh, I just happened to be uh, lucky enough to be telling you the story. But as an example, anecdotally, when I came to Vanderbilt, I said to Bob Dittis and Gordon Bernard, uh, you know, we need to study what is going to affect the older patients because they are so vulnerable to our atrogenic injury. We need to do something to help protect them from us in the ICU. And they asked me what that might be, what we thought the next big question would be for aging patients. And uh, we didn't know. So we looked at data from uh, my original New England Journal paper, which was a protocol to understand the potential role for spontaneous breathing trials, or SBTs. And I did this study when I was a chief resident at Wake Forest, right after I finished internal medicine residency. And we proved that employing the respiratory care practitioner as a decision maker about the SBT could get the patient off the ventilator two days earlier, shave 
uh, two days off of the ICU stay and cut the cost of care by $5,000 per patient and, uh, and, and cut complications in half. So we looked at that database to see how it played out for the older versus the younger patients. And what we found out was that the old patients did actually just as well with the recovery from respiratory failure as did the younger patients. But they would go on to have more bounce backs and more death. So getting off the ventilator was fine, but then they'd have more problems. And then Gordon uh, was just finishing up, and the Argent was just finishing up its 6 versus 12 trial, obviously probably the most landmark trial in all of critical care. And we decided to analyze that one too. We first had 300 patients to analyze. Now we've got 902 patients to analyze. And both of these papers turned out to be publications in the Annals of Internal Medicine, which said the following. Old people do great when they get into the ICU in terms of coming off the ventilator. And it doesn't appear physiologically from an oxygenation and ventilation perspective that they have a problem coming off, the, coming off and getting weaned. But in both circumstances, these over 1,000 patients that we studied, they had more bounce backs and more death. So we said, well, gosh, it's got to be a non-pulmonary situation. It's, you know, we're just following the break in our research here, and that's not ex what we expected to find. But if it's not the lungs, what is it? And that's where we hedged our bets on the brain. And we started studying delirium. And I bugged one of the queens of delirium, a woman named Sharon Inouye, who was at Harvard, at the t who was at Yale at the time, now at Harvard. And we came up with the CAM ICU. Right about the same time, Joanna Skrobik was coming up with the intensive care delirium screening checklist in Canada. And she and I actually met here in 2001 at the SCCM meeting. It wasn't in Hawaii, but it was at the SCCM meeting when she was presenting her data on the delirium screening checklist and I was presenting mine on the CAM ICU. And what we then did was we said, wow, we can now validly assess delirium in people who can't talk. They're intubated, but up against a 30 to 45 minute neuropsychiatric geriatric exam, we can tell you in a couple of minutes or over a shift, depending on which tool you use, if somebody has delirium or not. And these tools have panned out over the last decade and a half to be extremely specific, 90, 95% specific across many different languages in many different countries. And the tools are now translated into over 30 languages and used all over the globe. So we first had this idea of adding delirium into the realm of critical care, but nobody thought it was relevant or important. In fact, nurses used to literally laugh behind my back in the ICU, except they were laughing so loud, loudly, that I could hear them. And I'd say, what is so funny? Hey, Dr. West, you're talking about delirium. Nobody talks about that up here. This is, uh, this is ICU psychosis. It's fine. It's gonna, they're going to get better from it. And it's just something that happens. It's not dangerous. So we set out to use the tools to figure out if delirium was dangerous. And we found out that it was, of course, an independent predictor of four major problems. Death, length of stay, cost of care, and long-term brain dysfunction. And over the past numerous years, through many cohort studies and lots and lots of different investigators around the world, have shown that this delirium is indeed an independent predictor of these problems. So about that time, we got a lot of energy in our, in our, in our mojo here to try and figure out, well, how can we change the way critical care is practiced then to have less of this, of this nidus for injury? And that led us to do a combination of J.P. Cress's original study in the New England Journal on daily wake-ups plus our SBT study, and we put them together into what is now known as the ABC trial, Awakening Breathing Coordinated Trial, and it was published in Lancet some years later. Never in a million years did we think that putting this SAT, SBT together would end up additive. Each study independently, two days off mechanical ventilation, less complications, et cetera. Put them together, turning off the sedatives in the morning, then turning off the ventilator to do a spontaneous awakening, a spontaneous breathing trial. Instead of two days better, we got four days better. Now, we don't have time to go into all the nuances of how to conduct these SATs and SBTs. And you might use a drug that doesn't have somebody into a deep uh, sedative state and think that you could keep it going during extubation. And I think that that's fine if they're wide awake and not delirious um, and not having a respiratory suppressor on board. It may be the best thing for the patient. But the bottom line is that that's where we started to build these letters. And I wanted to comment about this just for a minute. We were not trying to be cute. 
what happened was that right around this time, see, some people say, well, this letter stuff is kind of hokey, isn't it? I mean, the alphabet. But we, what, what really happened was this. I read this book by Malcolm Gladwell. And many of you have read it called The Tipping Point. And Gladwell talks about what you do to make something tip. And in the book, he says, you know, in addition to the right types of people that have to share the message, like mavens who care about the 800 number on the back of ivory soap, uh, who would do that but a maven, a soap maven. Um, in addition to that, you have to have connectors, people who can really bring together interdisciplinary study over time. And you have to have salespeople. Those are the three types of people that Malcolm Gladwell said you had to have. But in addition to that, the message has to be sticky. So people at the time were talking about J.P. Cress's turn the sedatives off as a daily wake-up. But spontaneous breathing trial, daily wake-up, it doesn't really stick as well as making it called an awakening trial, breathing trial. Now you've got an A and a B, and they can be coordinated. Now you have the ABCs. So that's what happened. It was nothing fancier than just how should you market this? And not market it to make money. Market it so that people will believe it and remember it because it's sticky. So we did the trial, ABC. Then we started showing that delirium mattered to mortality and cost and length of stay, etc. D comes after C. You got A, B, C, D. Then J.P. Kress hits another home run in his, in his early mobilization study, A, B, C, D, E. And that was, that was it. That's how we started with the A, B, C, D, E's. But there, what you have, and I wanted to make sure this is super clear, what you have at that point is you've got letters that have been studied independent of one another, but have not been proven to work better if you group them at the bedside. So you don't technically have data to support them as a bundle. And that, this is the IHI definition, the Institute for Healthcare Improvements definition of a bundle, is that independent studies of the A by themselves, the B, the C, etc., that might be great. But if you want to call, call it a bundle, you need to study them together. So actually, for about four or five years, the IHI had done no more critical care. The IHI, which started in areas that included critical care, had abandoned our ICU for other types of quality improvement. But this work on delirium and over sedation and mobilization brought the IHI back. And a woman named Kelly McCutcheon Adams, beautiful person, social worker, just believed passionately that this was the right thing to do for our patients. And so for four or five years, we conducted um, seminars and collaboratives all over the United States. And people came from Japan and England, and we did this. But never in those years did we call it a bundle because she wouldn't let us. She's a stickler for this term, and she was defending the term. And it really didn't morph into a bundle <clears throat> until Michelle Ballas called one day and said, you know, I want to do a study in Nebraska. And it's going to be a single center study, but we want to study this bundle of yours. And with Ed Vasilevskis and, and U.S., would you be collaborators with us? We're going to see what happens if you bundle this stuff together. So we did. And you know the outcome there. It's cited in Marianne Sutter's article, which is right over there. There's about a thousand copies of it. Um, go get that article and read it. Michelle Ballas's single center study was very profound in that the pre-post period of study showed that the bundle not only improved the number of days without delirium and the days of mobilization, but the linchpin of outcomes, which had been made so important by the ARDSNET, which was ventilator-free days, was equaled by the bundle. So you want to know about the science of this? She showed that the bundle begat three more days alive and free of mechanical ventilation, which is the same amount of delirium-free days that 6 versus 12 got. And in her 300-patient study, she had a p-value that was right on the border of significance for survival. Whoa. Then that exceeded what we even expected to have happen. So with that in mind, we began to say, wow, maybe there's more to this. Maybe it actually is a deserving of the word bundle. And then the next uh, thing that happened was that people like Dale Needham at Johns Hopkins and, um, and the Michigan Keystone Project, Pat Poza and uh, many others there um, have done such a good job of showing that in, the, in these two other projects, the Hopkins Project and in the Keystone Project, that 
The bundle, it's a absolutely improved outcomes there with related to delirium, sleep integrity, and one of the quotes from the authors at the Keystone Project was that the whole was greater than the sum of the parts. The most important, though, study, I think, and it's over there against the wall, is the study done by Marianne Barnes-Daly, whose nickname is Jet, by the way. You're outed. Marianne's paper which is entitled Improving Hospital Survival and Reducing Brain Dysfunction at Seven California Community Hospitals, Implementing the PAD Guidelines via the ABCDEF Bundle. That allows me to clear up some confusion about terms. Imagine a table. On this side, you have the symptoms that your patients are suffering from. Pain, agitation, delirium, for example. How are you going to monitor for those symptoms at the bedside? You're going to use the middle column on the table, which are the validated tools for pain, like the CPOT or the BPS, for delirium, like the delirium screening checklist by Ioana Skrobik and, and her Canadian group, or the CAM-ICU. And then about agitation, anxiety, I skipped that one, sorry, uh, with, for example, Rich Rikers and Gil Frazier's, who are two huge names in this story that I wanted to make sure I mentioned. Uh, the, the SAS, Sedation Agitation Scale, or the RAS, Richmond Agitation Scale, made up by Kurt Sessler, who was going to call it the Sessler Agitation Sedation Scale, but then it would have been Sessler's ass. <laughs> so he called it the RAS instead. I now realize I've used the word ass three times in this talk. <laughs> I better quit. But Mary Ann Barnes Daly took on a study in which over 6,000 patients at these Sutter hospitals decided to study what happened when you implemented the ABCDEF bundle. How did we get that F on the end, by the way? Remember I told you about Gordon Moore. Gordon Moore said, you didn't let me see my family enough. It was wrong. And it wasn't as humane as it could have been for me in the ICU. So we'll give you the money, but you have to do something for family. And we had the A, B, C, D, E bundle, and F comes afterwards, and I said, wow, that's pretty easy. Let's fix that. But to, uh, to, to make the matter based on science, it had to be based on science, there were, a, there were as much data in the New England Journal of Medicine and JAMA published on the F than there were on any other aspect of the bundle. In fact, what I did in this, in this paper, the, uh, the plenary paper that I single authored for this talk, is I reviewed the science about the A to F, and I only included papers published in the top three clinical journals, the New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, and Lancet. Now, I was not trying to be exclusionary. I was trying to follow the rules of the CCM, by the way. There are hundreds of papers that we have collated that make up the science of the A to F bundle. And those investigators deserve their due recognition. But the problem is that, that Journals have page limitations, and they will only let you have, say, 75 uh, references for this particular topic. I already went to 100 and exceeded it by 25, so I couldn't include all those other ones. But I thought it would also make a statement, because people say all the time, well, you know, I know the literature, and um, this is kind of something I don't really feel compelled to adopt. But if they saw, in a matter of three paragraphs, describing the A to F bundle science, that I had listed over 20 manuscripts published in the New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, and Lancet, not even to include the other two or 300 papers which made up the science behind the bundle, I thought that it would make a statement. So that's what we did. And there was just as much data on there for the F as, as for the other letters. So she set out, Mary Ann Barnes-Daly, to study this. And over 6,000 patients, what she found were, is, is encapsulated on these four graphs. But I'm going to tell you what they show. What she learned was that survival improved in accordance with the degree of compliance that her hospitals engaged with, accomplished with the bundle. So let me restate that a couple of different ways to make sure it's understandable. Michelle Ballas showed before and after that before versus after, afterwards with the bundle, there was better survival, ventilator freedom, and, uh, and delirium freedom. But there was no dose-response relationship that she was able to come up with. But Mary Ann Barnes-Daly did. She learned that for every 10% increase in compliance across the x-axis, 
that you had a 15 percent improvement in survival and the same amount of improvement in the time awake and without brain dysfunction in the ICU. That means without delirium and coma. So you might say, well, that's just because it's uh, related to severity of illness and how much people applied to that, or it's age related, or it's sepsis, no sepsis, or on off vent. No. We used mathematical modeling. We used great multivariable modeling to adjust for sepsis, mechanical ventilation, and other variables, including severity of illness with Apache scores. And I'm telling you that this is after adjustment for those variables that we found out that this worked. So really that is the science behind the ABCDEF bundle. Uh, what it is, is liberation from iatrogenic injury. Why to do it? I thought that I would simply read the prologue of, my art of, of this article to tell you why. I cannot do it any better than a patient can. A patient tells us if we listen. And here's what the patient wrote. And this is the reason why you should consider changing your ritual at the bedside. So that at the bedside from now on, your ritual includes these scientific elements that make up the ABCDEF bundle. I can't teach you how in this, tech, in this lecture, but from, I think, 11.30 to 1.30 today, there's another session on this. Yesterday, there were sessions in the pediatric world, in the pediatric ICU, for application of the ADF bundle. And this is happening for young kids, babies, and adults. And if it hasn't happened for you yet, then here's why you should. I had septic shock four years ago from urosepsis, and I'm in my 50s, 50s. I'm writing because I have never felt like myself again. I can't think clearly. My memory has suffered. I am fatigued like never before. Before sepsis, I was active, hiking, biking, rock climbing, running, and now I am sedentary. I've seen my doctor and other doctors, and they look at me like I'm nuts. She wrote this, emailed it to our ICU delirium website. Maybe I'm not the only one. This has affected every aspect of my life. I even had to leave my job as an ICU nurse because it was wearing me out. <clears throat> I couldn't handle it, which kills me. I am that nurse you gave your hard patients to. The difficult families, hard traumas, not anymore. I just can't handle it. Do you have any advice for me? What doctors to see? How to explain what is going on with me? any treatment to get back to where I was, or doctors that specialized in post-sepsis treatment. I need help. So are we going to give it to her? Will we, as a medical community, galvanize ourselves to make the necessary changes to give her the help? People at Vanderbilt, like Sarah Bloom, Joanna Stallings, Carla Steven, Jim Jackson, the four people who run our post-ICU clinic are doing their best every Friday afternoon in that clinic to see the survivors of our Vanderbilt ICU who have been dismantled in terms of their life. But they're providing them hope. And we should leave the room knowing that the hope is there. And what a joy it is to be in medicine. How privileged are we to be able to dive down into our patients' lives and then mercifully provide them healing and lift them back up? That's my definition of mercy. Diving down into the chaos of another person's life and providing them a lift up and a healing circumstance. Doing good for them in this way is our life's calling. That is why we went into medicine. So is it okay then and I point this out in the article, is this okay that this most recent survey, which is under review, uh, I point out in the article that we're not doing good enough, and so I'm going to use data from an unpublished paper, which is under review, shh, 1,500 respondents from 47 countries asked about these different components of the ABCDEF bundle. Where are we in 2017? Let me tell you. We found out that 60% of these 1,500 respondents from 47 countries said they had employed aspects of the bundle. 83% were paying attention to pain, 90% to anxiety, and 70% to delirium. So on face value, this looks good. But when you dive deep into this, we found out that 
only 66%. That's only two out of three of these ICUs were doing SATs and SPTs. Only 42% were using a validated delirium tool. 30% had a mobility team. 20% were using a mobility scale or even looking for ICU-acquired weakness. And only 33% paying attention to the F of family in an overt, explicit way. So while two-thirds of us say we do it, it looks like about two-thirds of us actually don't. We've got to do better. So in closing, let me bring you back to yourself in the chair. Why did you come? And what sort of accountability will you leave at the end of your professional career? We are ordinary people. We're nothing special. But we've studied and we've worked hard. And if we work together, we become a team that can lift patients through their suffering. In a sense, you could say we have been commissioned. The middle of that word commissioned is missy. In Latin, it means to be sent. We have been sent to serve these patients. And we have to do so with all of our personhood. I'll leave you with two clinical examples, and then I'll stop. One is my patient who came in with necrotizing fasciitis of her face. She had 60% of her face removed through about 15 different operations. We employed the ABCDEF bundle and ICU liberation diligently in her life throughout the next 25 days. On the day that she passed her SBT, she was extubated and she was walking because she had been early mobilized for the previous 15 days. In the old way, back in the 90s, when my attending told me, I don't give a rats, you know what, I told you I wasn't going to say it again. She would have been in bed, immobilized, tied down, and basically dehumanized for all that time. She would have had profound ICU-acquired weakness. She would have had myositis, ossific hands, calcification of her joints, but not in the new way. She's walking. We're such good friends now. She writes me from the beach telling me what it means to listen to the waves. I just had dinner with her husband and her son uh, last week at Vanderbilt. They were telling me what a difference it made for their mother to be alive, their wife to be alive, etc. But not all, not all of these patients will live. And the A to F bundle is just as much, which you built, by the way, your observations, the scientists, all of us around the world built this bundle. This bundle that we built that we're not employing adequately enough is just as much about the end of life process as it is the living process. So I wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal a few months ago about this story. The man came in, he had bad nosocomial pneumonia, he was on the ventilator, he was an old man, he was very weak, he was a veteran at the VA hospital in Nashville. We had permission to use his story. He got a little better, we extubated him, we sent him to the floor, he had a big stroke came back. I walked in. We, uh, we didn't think he was going to make it, but we asked the family, look, what matters to him? I can't tell you all that's the matter with him, but empathetically, because I want to not feel sorry for him, I want to feel with him, which is the definition of empathy. I want to dive into this chaos of his life. What matters to him? And they said, what he wants is to be baptized. And this is not about any one religious or spiritual path. This was his path. We've done similar things for our Buddhists, and we respect our atheists similarly. So this is across the board, whatever the patient tells us is what matters to them. This is what we adhere to. In this circumstance, the man wanted to be baptized. I said, well, no biggie. We can sprinkle some water on him. We'll get the chaplain up here, whatever. And they said, nope, doc, full dunk. What? Yeah, full dunk. He's on a ventilator, you know. Yes. Okay, and then behind me is a nurse standing there looking like she swallowed a canary with this big box that she got at Costco, which is a huge inflatable pool. <laughs> yeah. So we blew the pool up. This thing was half as long, two thirds as long as this white table right here. And they were you know, caravanning these, these buckets of warm water. You can't put a, a dying man in a cold water pool. So I had to get hot water. Then that, that wasn't working. They were sloshing water all over the place. So they, the dialysis guy came and hooked up the dialysis tubing to the hot water heater. Isn't that cool? And we ran the dialysis tubing in there to keep a constant flow of warm water in there. This is all documented in the WSJ. And by the way, intensive care medicine wanted the story too. So they put it in ICM so you can find it at either location. But this is what ABCDEFs is about. You see, if we hadn't been doing the bundle, he would have been delirious heavily sedated, and not able to communicate what he wanted. 
But because of the bundle, he was awake, we paid attention to his personhood, and we got him what he needed in the dying days of his life. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time.